over to the book of Acts. We are looking tonight at a new section of Acts, Ananias and the Mafia. You didn't know that the Mafia existed that long ago, did you? <laughs> well, yes, groups like the Mafia have been around for a very, very long time. And in fact, oh, I won't get off on it, but even find some illustrations of that in the Old Testament. Now, clearly, very much like the Mafia, but that will have to wait for one of my Old Testament series rather than tonight in Acts 23. Tonight we're looking at verses 1 through 10. Acts chapter 23, verses 1 through 10. Now, the last time that we were together in the book of Acts was actually January 24th, 2016, because on the 31st, which was last week, we had our fifth Sunday special on evangelism, the video called 180 Degrees, How People's Minds Are Changed. Uh, within just a few seconds, just a few minutes after they begin to realize the comparisons between Hitler's Holocaust and the abortion industry today, and uh, how that opened the door for many of them, as you heard at the end of that video, many of them realized that they needed Christ. And that, of course, is the whole purpose. Uh, whenever we talk to people, we engage them in the culture in which they find themselves, but at the same time, our goal and our responsibility is to share the good news that Christ died for sinners and that he can save them too. So I hope you enjoyed that, but that means that you have to kind of think back two weeks now to where we were, uh, which was when I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you, part two, <laughs> which is what was going on with Paul and the Romans as they dragged him from the temple courtyard and were going to examine him <laughs> by scourging. When I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. Well, tonight we're in Acts chapter 23. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, and now, of course, the chief captain has brought him down to the council. Remember verse 30 of the last chapter said, On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Whoa, what a way to begin the trial, right? <laughs> what a way to begin an examination where they didn't have control of him. The Romans brought him down and the Romans are just trying to find out what is going on here. Uh, it tells you something also because apparently the Roman centurion didn't speak Hebrew, this chief captain. Uh, because he doesn't seem to be knowing what's going on in the council either, as we discover at the end of this passage. So uh, the Apostle Paul was quite a linguist. He clearly spoke Hebrew. He clearly spoke Greek, because uh, the chief captain recognizes that. He spoke Greek to the chief captain. Uh, he spoke Latin. He spoke Aramaic. God chose a fitted instrument, one who was prepared for the ministry to which God would call him. And you know, God always gives you opportunity and prepares you for specific ministries. He never asks you to do something that he's not prepared you to do. Or if he asks you to do it and he has given you opportunity to prepare and you have failed to do it, then he will rebuke you and bring you to shame. And we're going to be talking about shame a little bit later in the um, message tonight. But anyway, so Paul is standing there. Ananias says, hit him in the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, now talk about hypocrisy. <laughs> and it's amazing how Paul responds to this. They said, revilest thou God's high priest? In other words, here was a man who felt himself above the law. You know, we have courts like that today that, as one Chief Justice many years ago said, the law is whatever we say it is. Really, folks, that's getting very far away from what the United States of America was founded on. We were to be a nation of laws, not a, not a nation of men. We were to have controls and checks and balances, and that has, as you know, gotten quite out of, out of balance today. And so, this is a man who thought himself above the law. And Paul recognized that and rebuked him. And those who stood by, who were very used to being little wimpy characters who were manipulated by the authorities, 
said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, and it is amazing the humble response that Paul gives. Now there are many reasons why he may have given this response, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, the Lord willing. I might just suggest that Paul talks about uh, his thorn in the flesh, which appears to be an eyesight problem. Perhaps he did not recognize or be able to see with any clarity who it was, but there are other reasons too. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Paul goes back to his foundation. Very important when you're in a court of law, even if somebody else is doing something wrong. You lay a foundation, you go back to your foundation, you keep hammering on your foundation, and the foundation for the believer is Scripture. Remember, stick with that. Someday you may be put on trial. I suspect I will be. It's just sort of par for the course if you're a Christian living in a time when persecution arises, and I think it's coming here in our country. But notice the humility with which he speaks and the foundation which he has already laid when he gave his speech on the stairs and the foundation to which he now goes back. For it is written. We'll talk about the context of that in the Old Testament uh, later, but for tonight, just we'll hear it. Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, folks, we've had in the past, and perhaps will, and probably will in the future, have some very bad presidents and very bad governors and very bad members of the legislature and so on. But we need to be careful about how we speak of them and what we say. We may disagree with them. We may disagree with them violently. We may disagree with them because they are theologically apostate and they are wicked. But how you speak of them always has to be tempered with respect. And Paul understood that, and that's what Paul is saying here in this passage. But when Paul perceived, but he said, there's one thing that I can do. I can see here in the council, and Paul knew pretty well who these guys were. Remember, Paul had been sent out with letters from the chief priests to go and arrest believers. So he had a pretty good sense of who was on the Sanhedrin. And he knew that it was split into two major parties and a couple of minor parties among the Zealots and the Herodians, but the two major parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. <laughs> He's pulling a party line vote. Have you ever seen that in Congress? <laughs> the, you get a hot issue and people can't really decide what's going on, and so a party line vote comes down. And here we got the two big parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, of course, believed in the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul was preaching the resurrection. And when he so said, there was a, arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Very, very clear. We have religious Jews on one side, and we have secular Jews on the other side. We have those who believe in the supernatural and those who do not believe in the supernatural. You know, the Israeli Knesset is divided that way today, too. If you go at any point in Jewish history, you'll find that there are those who are secular Jews and those who are religious Jews. Doesn't mean they're saved, but they are religious. They recognize the authority of the Torah, the Tanakh, the Torah, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the, the law, the writings and the prophets, but they don't see the Messiah in them. But they realize that that is a word from God and that there is a supernatural realm in addition to the natural realm. <laughs> you could say the creationists versus the evolutionists. The people who believe that God did it and the people who believe it just happened. You know, that goes back a long way. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. A spirit or an angel. 
You know, Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light, and if you get into the Kabbalah and the Jewish mysticism, you'll find all kinds of mystical kinds of things like that. The Jews accept that. They won't accept Jesus Christ as the final revelation of our Lord God. They say, no, uh, he, he's just a man. Oh yeah, he was, he was obviously a man who made a great impact in Jewish history. But they don't recognize him as God. Interesting here, they don't say, if God has spoken to him, they say, if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to, un, to him, let us not fight against God. And there arose a great dissension. Well, you know, there are certain groups of people that love to fight. Not just the Jews, but churches too. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him to the castle. Apparently what went on is the trial broke down into not just a fight between the two sides where they're uh, throwing yarmulkes at each other, <laughs> but they apparently, the Pharisees saw the Sadducees were moving in for the kill on Paul and they ran over and they tried to grab Paul and pull him over to their side and the Sadducees had got one arm and the Pharisees had got the other arm. Can you imagine that going on? I mean, it, it tells us that that's what the chief captain thought was going on. He couldn't understand the Jewish conversation. He had no idea what was going on, but what he saw was it looked like they weren't going to, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and bring him to the castle. Wow, can you imagine that, a trial? It's going on. Suddenly a riot breaks out. Two sides get taken. The, the, the prisoner who's in the dock, suddenly there are people pulling him one way, people pulling him the other way, and in march the Marines to break it up. Folks, this is stuff that really happened. These are real people. Did you know there are real people like this alive today? <laughs> Have you ever run into any of them? Anybody who has a really hot head about something? Yeah. Well, so that's our text for tonight. So the last time when we were in Acts, back in January 24th, when I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. The first thing that we saw was that we saw the law of harvest at work in the text. What you sow, you reap. Even if you're forgiven for your past, and even if God is going to use you in a mighty way. What you sow, you reap. Paul had sown some things, and he had some things in his resume. We were talking about resumes before that. Some things that were coming home to roost at that point. He had beaten Christians. He had killed Christians. He had done it with legal authority. And we're in a legal situation here. Legal trial is going on. He had done it with legal authority. Now, and all through that ministry that God gave him, he suffers in a very similar manner to the suffering that he had inflicted. What you sow, you reap. The chief captain, with legal authority, had threatened him with a repeat lesson. The Jews here are threatening to give him a repeat lesson under the auspices of law. And the Apostle Paul tried to appeal to the law. He appealed to the law with the Roman chief captain and as a result didn't get his beating. Now he's in a court of law and he tries to appeal to the law of God and the people who are supposed to be supporting the law of God are the ones who are trying to kill him. Kind of odd, isn't it? The Romans obeyed law, human law. The Jews didn't want to obey divine law. The third lesson that we had learned was, remember, your true resume may include some things of which you are later ashamed. And Paul, witnessing the stoning of Stephen and doing it with approval and how he killed Christians had that in his resume. But those things can be used by God to motivate us to greater zeal. If you understand the wicked things in your past and how that God used to convict you of sin and to make you recognize how sinful you are, makes you love him more, draws you closer to him, and motivates you for greater service that he would care enough about you to draw you to Christ. Paul says so in 1 Timothy 1, 12 and following, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful. Counted me faithful? That's the way God looked at it. Putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, 
and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. God can look at your past. He knows what's in your heart. And God can show mercy, and He does, regardless of what our past has been. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save really, really, really good people like all of you all and me up here, and you sitting out there, those watching on the Internet, us really good people. That's why he came into the world, right? No. Christ came into the world, what does Paul say? To save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul is a an under pattern for us. Remember we talked about a light table. I told you about how back in the days when I used to do art, we had light tables and you could put down a, an original and the light is shining up through it and then you put your tracing paper on top of it and you can copy the outline perfectly. Paul says that's what God did with him. God didn't choose somebody who was a squeaky, you know, little Miss Goody Two Shoes. He chose somebody who was a blasphemer and injurious and a persecutor to show how far the grace of God can go. He chose a man who had been involved in the death of Stephen, a man who had blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ before Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and turned him around. Paul says, I'm a pattern for you. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ. Paul saw the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. It blinded him. The Apostle Paul passed it to the next generation. They saw him and they copied him. He passed it to Timothy and Titus and Trophimus and many others. And they passed it to others. And they passed it to others. And they passed it to others. And there's a trail of blood that leads all the way from the cross to today. Men and women, boys and girls of God, who were, have been an under-pattern for us. So that today you and I are now called to stand next in line and be an under-pattern for those who will follow us if our Lord tarries. Have you traced the outline carefully so that those who see Christ through your life will be able to trace the pattern in their life and carry it to the next generation if our Lord tarries. When they see you, do they see Jesus? That's what's going on here. Paul isn't one of these ivory castle kind of people where he sits in a tower and spews theological nonsense. He's a man who lived what he believed and suffered for what he believed. And he's the pattern for us. Someday you may have to suffer for Christ. It's not a pleasant thought. But Paul is a pattern, and he says so as he writes to Timothy. For this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now those were things that Paul was ashamed of, but he didn't try to hide them from his resume when they were a useful tool because they proved the grace of God. I think all of us here in this room, I know I do, I'm sure you do too because we're all sinners. All of us have things on our resumes that we would not put on our written resumes of life experiences when applying for a job. God has not called on us to reveal every sin that we ever committed because there are some things that should not be spoken of publicly, and I gave you many examples of that when we went through this section a few weeks ago. If God wants to reveal those things in eternity, 
He'll do it at the judgment seat of Christ. But it's shameful to talk about those things now. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5:11 and 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. There are some things that you don't talk about. There are specific exceptions. For example, in the area of uncovering immorality, for example, a father has to diligently investigate the moral purity of the man who's interested in marrying his daughter. It's very important. And I told you how I grilled the young men that have married my daughters. He must investigate with all due diligence to uncover anything that would disqualify the interested suitor, anything that would spoil the moral purity of his daughter. But normally it's not your business to be a busybody in other men's matters and try to worm the juicy tidbits of gossip out of other people, even if past sins are part of their resume. We saw why God does allow things that would spoil our life resumes, because getting those things on our resumes ends up giving God the glory because only He is good. Nobody can boast in His presence. 1 Corinthians 1.26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now he talks about us. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Did you get chosen? Were you among the um, the wise, the mighty, the noble? I don't think most of us were. Or were you among the trash, groveling around among the worms in the mud? The base things of the world, the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. And here's the reason that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. How did you get into Christ Jesus? Well, you were just walking along. One day you decided, you know, I think I'm going to go over there and I'm going to put myself in Christ Jesus. I'm pretty good. I can go over and open that door myself. Listen, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You weren't sick in trespasses and sins. You were dead. You were rotting, filthy, stinking corpse spiritually. You didn't just walk on over and say, Jesus, I'm here. Aren't you glad to have me? He is the one who regenerated you. He is the one who put faith into you. He is the one who irresistibly drew you to himself. He is the one who loved you with an everlasting love long before you knew him. He is the one who knew you from eternity past. It is he that put you in Christ Jesus of him are ye in Christ Jesus whom God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption all of that came from Christ it didn't come from you why verse 31 that according as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord what a difference it makes doesn't it now that brought us to where we are tonight, the issue of shame. Shame is a powerful motivator when used the way God wants it to be used. I gave you an outline of shame two weeks ago. Tonight I'm going to talk about the things of which we should be ashamed, but more importantly, the things of which we should not be ashamed. The outline for the three different areas dealing with shame. Number one, there are some things of which we are ashamed that were merely stupid. That is, they are an embarrassment to our pride. Those are things that we can forget and move on. And I gave you the illustration of how I sat at the wrong row in a funeral, even though I'm a pastor and I should have known better, and I had to be told to move. <laughs> you know, that brought embarrassment. But that's a, that's a shame of stupidity. That's a shame of not paying attention to what I'm doing. Uh, that's not a moral shame or an evil that is, you know, wicked in the sight of God. It's just stupidity. And God used that to teach me a lesson, a lesson of humility, because everybody was watching and everybody knew who I was. Second, there are some things of genuine shame that make us ashamed, but have been forgiven if we have confessed them and repented of them. There's that false shame, which is just a matter of our stupidity and of our embarrassment. Then there is real shame, which involves sin. 
Things like theft and immorality, slander, libel, hatred, pride, and all the so-called seven deadly sins, things that we've talked about in the past. But those are things like the Apostle Paul uses his own testimony to speak of the shameful things in his past because he knew he had confessed them, he had repented of them, and he had been forgiven. Those are things that we can look back on and say, yes, I know that the reason those things were in my life, God allowed them to happen so that it would bring me to humility, but it would bring me to repentance more importantly. Humility for the first type, repentance for the second type. Embarrassment for the first type, confession for the second type. But that brought us to the third area of shame. There are some things that if we don't deal with them in the way God commands. In other words, there are things that are sinful in your life right now that if you don't deal with them the way that God commands you to deal with them are going to come up again. Those are the things of which you will be ashamed at the return of Christ. John says, so that we would not be ashamed at his coming. In other words, there will be some who are ashamed at his coming. And we don't want to be among those who are ashamed at his coming. Remember the parable of the, the talents. And the one guy who went and hid it in the earth. And the Lord came back. And he hadn't done anything with what God had given him. He had failed to maximize his potential. God has given to each one of us, has placed inside each one of us, has, has generously given to us spiritual gifts and opportunities and a point in history where we live to make an impact for Jesus Christ. He didn't just put us here because there weren't enough people on the planet. He put us here to make a difference for Him, to bring glory to Him. Are you maximizing your potential? Or are you just doing the same old thing over and over and over and over again and sliding through life because it is comfortable? Ah, oh, dear people, I do love you. I want to see you get every possible heavenly reward when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ. I know sometimes it seems like I treat you roughly like this morning. I had a coach that all of us thought treated us roughly. He wouldn't let us get away with anything. He would make us do sections and entire workouts over. But you know why he did it? Because he loved us and he wanted to see us succeed. And he had winning teams. My dad told me about an instance when he was in the military. He had a sergeant who was really a rough and gruff character. And in basic training, that sergeant really came down on them hard. In fact, my dad overslept once when Reveille was sounded. And the sergeant came into the barracks, and there he was, lying asleep in his bunk. The sergeant took his big hobnailed boot and slammed it right into the middle of my dad's back and slammed him out onto the floor. A lot of pain. My dad resented it. But you know, after basic training, this was World War II, after basic training, that same big, huge, six-foot, four-inch tall, 280-pound monster, solid muscle, who had yelled at them, screamed at them, cursed at them, gotten in their faces, made them crawl on the ground in the mud, do all the things that they didn't want to do, stood in front of them with tears. He said, man, I know that most of you hate me. Because I haven't been easy on you. I've treated you roughly. But I want you to know I did it because I love you. And I don't want to see more dead American boys in body bags. You're going to war. Forgive me if I treat you roughly. I love you. 
and you are in a war. Three types of shame. There are some things that if we don't deal with them in the way that God commands, we will be ashamed at His coming. So be thankful when God allows you to be put to shame for legitimate reasons. He is using shame to burn out the garbage in your life and to conform you to the image of Christ. Shame can be an intense blessing to cause you to live the rest of your life for Jesus Christ. That's what happened to Paul. And that's what brings us to the things about which we do not need to be ashamed. Things that actually transcend your life resume. Your life resume has those three different kinds of shame in it. But there are some things of which we do not have to be ashamed that transcend our life resume. We see those principles played out in our text tonight as Paul is examined not by the Romans but by the Jewish Sanhedrin. Now remember we've been talking about what Jewish children parents are supposed to be teaching their children <laughs> uh, in the morning messages. Pass it on. Child training, parts one, two, and three we've seen so far. You know, Jewish parents today and throughout history have taught their children, don't be ashamed of being Jewish. Don't be ashamed of being Jewish. Okay. <laughs> you are Jewish, it is good. Because Jews have been persecuted throughout the centuries. You do not need to be ashamed of being Jewish. That's a good thing to pass on to your kids. It's also a good thing to pass on to your kids. You do not need to be ashamed of being a Christian. Do not be ashamed. Here are the things of which you do not need to be ashamed. Things that the New Testament states for us very clearly of which we do not need to be ashamed. There are many things that we don't have to be ashamed about that both inform, motivate, and empower the Christian life. You know, the first thing that we don't need to be ashamed about is the gospel. The very first thing that we're not supposed to be ashamed about is the gospel, even if some people think it is foolish, even if some people think it's scandalous, even if some people mock you and criticize you and ridicule you and fire you from your job. Paul says in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. He gives us two reasons not to be ashamed, and he gives us two people groups to whom it is applied. The two reasons that we are not to be ashamed are because it is the power of God. That's number one. Now, question for you. Is there anything in the world that is stronger than the power of God? Does anybody have an idea want to raise your hand? What do you think is stronger than the power of God? Anything? Paul says the gospel is the power of God. You want to tap into the, the power of God? You want to have the power of God at your disposal? You want to have the power of God that can penetrate the darkest darkness, break through the hardest heart, knock down the walls, that resist? You want the power of God? You've got it. The gospel is the power of God. The second reason not to be ashamed is the gospel is the gospel of eternal salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. As you look at eternity, is there anything in eternity that is better than salvation. You have two options. You don't have three options. There's no purgatory. Forget the purgatory business. You got two options. You got heaven, you got hell. Salvation gets you to heaven. If you don't have salvation, you go to hell. Those are your only two options. And people put it off. Now you have the gospel. It is the gospel, not you. You're a worm, and so am I. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, but God has put it into the hands of little worms. And he says, go get them, boys. Sick them. 
and we say, ooh, man, that, that's shiny, that's pretty, that's, ooh, that's a leather-covered Bible. Pastor, when did you get a new black leather-covered Bible? You have that brown one that's falling apart that's got so many notes written in it that you can hardly hold it together when you're preaching. You got a black Bible? Yeah, I've actually had this one for quite a few years. I'm using the other one now for my study, but I'm not bringing it to preaching because it does fall apart. Pages fall out. You know, it's hard to hard to preach out of a Bible when half the Bible's on the floor and you know another quarter of it's you know down here in front of you somewhere. No, it's not because it's shiny, not because it's nice, not because it's new, not because it even says this book belongs to Christian Spencer in the front of it. It is the power of God. And it applies. It is for salvation. When you think of the gospel, do you think of it that way? Or do you think about it, what nice thing will it say to me today? What kind of warm fuzzies can I get by reading my daily devotionals for a minute and a half? The two people groups to whom it's applied to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, as we've been going through the book of Acts, we've noticed how the Apostle Paul always went to the synagogues first. That was his, his principal means of transporting the gospel across the ancient world. Because colonies of Jews had been established in all the major cities, and those were people who already had a foundation in Old Testament studies. So he could go and talk to them about what the Old Testament said about the coming Messiah, and God would open their eyes, and he would have a base from which to thrust out to his next location. And then that church plant, with its foundation, would be able to reach the pagan community around them and be able to instill in them a knowledge of God. Paul did it to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, the Hellenized world, the world in which the Apostle Paul lived, the pagans, if you will, the America that we live in today. The purpose, Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. To the Jew first, yes. But there's some very important application to the Gentiles. Paul says so, that we are to make known the riches of the glory of this mystery. Question for you. I, I'm going to pause before I read the rest of that verse. I have talked to you about mysteries in the New Testament, and that a mystery is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but now is revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 3. Question. How many mysteries are listed in the New Testament, things that were not revealed in the Old Testament, but are now revealed in the New Testament? How many of them? You got it! <laughs> All right! One person remembered it! Seventeen different mysteries! Now those are not little tiny points. Some of those mysteries are very big, big mysteries. Big, big balls that had not been revealed in the Old Testament as are now revealed in the Apostles and Prophets by the Spirit. There's 17 of them. Sometime take your concordance and look up the word mystery, musterion, and track it all the way through the New Testament and see if you can categorize them, organize them, analyze them. I've done it for you, if anybody was taking notes. There are 17 of them. All right, back to our text. I'm glad I just gave a test and somebody passed it. <laughs> very good. Okay, so now, the first thing of which we're not ashamed is the gospel. You know, the second thing of which we are not to be ashamed is hope that is motivated by love. The second thing of which the believer is not to be ashamed is hope motivated by love. In other words, don't worry if people mock your eschatology. Uh, look at Romans 5.5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hope that is motivated by love. We don't have to be ashamed of our eschatology. The Christian is looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for the blessed hope. You don't need to be ashamed, even if most people in the so-called reform camp mock premillennial, pre-tribulational eschatology. Bible Presbyterians are the only ones who believe in pre-mill, pre-trib. All the rest of them are all mill or post-mill. And they will mock you and scorn you and say you are not historic Protestants, and they will mock you and scorn you and say you're not historic Presbyterians. Nonsense. 
This is the historic position because it goes back to the apostles. You can't get more, much more historic than that. <laughs> so don't let them mock you. Just remember, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You see, the blessed hope, the belief in the imminent return of Christ, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, not mid-trib, not post-trib, it is the blessed hope that motivates you to godly living teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, we know we're going to be okay when we get to heaven. There's not going to be any sin there. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you live now? How do you live in this present world? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. John says, we don't want to be ashamed that He's coming. That's the blessed hope. That's why you deal with that third area of shame that we talked about just a moment ago. The sins that you continue to hold on to, that you haven't confessed, that you haven't repented of, you still sort of grovel along in them in the dark, behind closed doors, where nobody knows about it except you know about it. Men, do you look at pornography? you got your computer set up so that you can go to certain sites. you set it up so that nobody can track it. Oh my, I can get off on talking about a bunch of sins here. You make sure you have them repented. Make sure you have them confessed. Make sure you've dealt with them under the blood of Christ. Otherwise, you will be ashamed that it's coming and it will be revealed. The day shall make manifest and every man's work shall be revealed, yet so is by fire. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For what is our hope? Remember, we're talking about hope here. Things that don't make us ashamed. The gospel, we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. And we do not have to be ashamed of our eschatology. We don't have to be ashamed of the blessed hope. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Hope, folks. And it's not just sort of, well, I sort of hope it will happen like a wistful thinking kind of a thing. It is a guaranteed reality of the future because it is based on the promises of God. We don't have to be ashamed of living for Christ. Many people are embarrassed because others mock them when they live for the Lord Jesus. You see, the Christian expresses his heart hope, that is of the return of Christ, he expresses his heart hope in his visible lifestyle. The text here says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Shed abroad, what does that mean? It means it doesn't just stay inside in one place. It doesn't just sort of hide out in one of our closets that we keep the door closed of all the time to make sure that none of that light gets out. There's this light brightly burning, and we say, man, we don't want anybody to see that, so we close the doors, we pull the curtains, you know, we hide under the bed, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. It shows up in your lifestyle. 1 Corinthians 9.10 Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that, that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. That's stuff that deals with the way we live. How about Philippians 1.20 According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. You see, if you have this hope, you are not ashamed. First Thessalonians 5.8 But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Folks, hope is what keeps you from being ashamed. Hope is what motivates your Christian living. Hope is what informs your Christian testimony. Hope is what keeps you focused on eternity instead of all the suffering that you go through in this life. And it's a reality. This is a hope that's a reality. We do not have to be ashamed of living for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Why are we not ashamed? Because the Christian is looking for the hope of heaven. Romans 8.24 For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Verse 25 But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Has life ever gotten dull? Has life ever gotten tough? Has life ever gotten to a point where you wish that something else would go on instead of what is going on now? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on eternity. We hope, we hope with patience and wait for it. The hope of heaven, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Colossians 1, 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Hey, that takes us back to the first one. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. The hope and the gospel tied together. A hope that is laid up for us in heaven. We've heard it in the word of truth. That's the word of God. That's our foundation. We don't have to be ashamed because the Christian's hope is squarely centered in Christ. And we are not ashamed of Jesus. Oh, I hope you're not ashamed of Jesus. Can you think of any time when you knew you're supposed to say something? Knew you're supposed to speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ? Knew you were supposed to identify as a Christian? And you didn't. Can you think of any times? I can. I think of them with shame. I've confessed them as sin. I've repented. That means now I try to take advantage of every opportunity that comes up, even if it costs something. The Christian's hope is squarely centered in Christ, and so we are not ashamed of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said. In fact, we find it twice in the Gospels. We find it in the Gospel of Mark. We find it in the Gospel of Luke. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Do we have an adulterous and sinful generation? How many of you think we live in an adulterous, sinful generation? Oh, everybody. Okay. Oh, well, I'm glad you... So, here, here it is. This is talking to you then, uh, and to me. Whosoever therefore... Oh, that means all of us. Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words. We don't just say, uh, you know, they're talking, and we say, oh, well, there was Jesus. I thought, Jesus, you know, remember Jesus? And we sort of wander off. Ashamed of me and of my words. In this adulterous and sinful generation, Oh, listen to the next phrase. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Are you ashamed of Jesus when the pressure is on? Not when we're sitting around having fellowship at church. Luke 9.26 For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. The procession begins, and Jesus leads the train in all glory and beauty like the pillar of smoke coming from the wilderness and all the glorious angels the triumphal procession and the hosts of heaven are gathered and the saints of all the ages and Jesus looks at many of them with a glorious smile on his face. And you look up expectantly and he looks at you with sorrow and tears in his eyes and casts his eyes down and goes on to the next. And all the host of heaven, the angels, look at you 
why were you ever ashamed of this king? When you read scripture, people, try to picture it. Try to put yourself into the picture. Where do you fit? Some of you have seen the children's books, Find Waldo. And there are all these different pictures, great big complex pictures that the artist has drawn. Where's Waldo? And he's a funny little cartoon character. And you hunt, and you hunt, and you hunt, and suddenly there he is in the picture. When you read pictures like this in Scripture, you're Waldo, you're in there somewhere. What are you doing? What's your location in the picture? How will Jesus respond to you? We don't have to be ashamed because the Christian's hope is squarely centered in Christ. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. The Christian's hope is squarely centered in Christ. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We don't have to be ashamed because our hope is centered in Christ who is risen. 1 Peter 1.13 Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center of our hope for eternity when he comes for us. 1 Peter 1.21 Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Oh, people, we do not need to be ashamed because we have a guaranteed hope. Do you understand why Paul was not ashamed? He was not ashamed to stand on the stairs and talk to the Jews in Hebrew, even though they just tried to kill him. He was not ashamed to talk to the captain because he had a living hope in him. He was not ashamed to go down before the Sanhedrin because he had a living hope in him. He knew they could kill him. They tried to. He faced it all the time. He was not ashamed of the gospel because he was not ashamed of the hope, the guaranteed hope that God gave. We do not have to be ashamed because the Christian's hope is firmly based in Scripture. Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Your hope isn't founded in philosophy. Your hope isn't founded in a bunch of interesting historical facts. Your hope is founded in the Scriptures. It's the Word of God which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your hope has a foundation a guaranteed, sure foundation, a foundation that has never been proved wrong, a foundation that is always true, a foundation in which every prophecy that has been made and fulfilled has been fulfilled literally and accurately, precisely like it said, not allegorically, not mythologically, not just in sort of general terminology, but precisely and exactly as predicted. You have a firm foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than he's already said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Oh, we do not need to be ashamed because the Christian's hope is firmly based in Scripture. I see our time is up. We do not need to be ashamed because the Christian's hope is guaranteed by God himself and thus is an anchor in the storms of life. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. That by two immutable things. Immutable means they can't change. Two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. When people say, well, you know, what's impossible for God? It's impossible for God to lie. It says so right here. Everything that God says is true we might have a strong consolation 
who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. You do not need to be ashamed because God, by two immutable things in which it is impossible for him to lie, has given you the guaranteed promise that these things are true. And if you flee to Jesus for refuge, you have a guaranteed hope. Verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. How badly is your ship being battered by the waves? You have a guaranteed hope. You have an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Jesus, our great high priest, is whom he's talking about. He is the one who has entered behind the veil from the holy place to the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was located, and where on Yom Kippur, Leviticus 17, the, the high priest would go and would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. The Hilasterion, it's called in the New Testament. The mercy seat between the cherubim, where the presence of God rested in the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament. Who sprinkle the blood of the offering. And Jesus is our great high priest. He's the one who is portrayed in the book of Hebrews not merely as our priest, but also as our mercy seat where the blood was sprinkled. Oh, dear people, the depth and the beauty of Scripture. Don't just skim over it. Mine, it's gold. The riches that you'll find there. You do not need to be ashamed. We've talked about the things of which we are ashamed. Paul talked about the things of which he was ashamed. Paul tells us that there are things of which many will be ashamed at the coming of Christ because they have not confessed them as sin, have not repented from them. But there are things for which we do not need to be ashamed. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. We do not need to be ashamed of our eschatology. We do not need that blessed hope. We do not need to be ashamed of the hope that is in us about what Christ is doing in our lives, transforming us, conforming us to the image of Christ. We do not need to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the gospel. We do not need to be ashamed of the Christian's hope because we are not ashamed of Jesus. We do not need to be ashamed because our hope is firmly based in Scripture. We do not need to be ashamed of our hope because it is guaranteed by God Himself who cannot lie and who has given us these two immutable things and is an anchor to our souls in the storm of life because Jesus Himself has gone behind the veil. He, our great high priest, has offered His own blood upon the mercy seat, upon His own body as He hung on Calvary's cross. We do not need to be ashamed Oh, it's powerful. There's much more. I'll have to save it for next week. But never be ashamed of Jesus. Remember, Paul is the under pattern. As his life traces the life of Jesus, so Timothy's life traced the life of Jesus. So John's life traced the life of Jesus. So Polycarp's life traced the life of Jesus. So the other believers who have lived down through the centuries have traced carefully over the pattern of those who have gone before them until it came to you. If somebody traced your life tonight as you sit here, would the pattern that you are living in which you are an example would that pattern be a faithful replica of Jesus Christ that they could pass to the next generation if you were the only Christian they ever met? That's a serious responsibility, isn't it? Our gracious Heavenly Father, now we thank you for your word and for its power and that we do not have to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news. We don't have to be ashamed of the hope of the gospel. We don't have to be ashamed of the hope of the resurrection. We don't have to be ashamed of the hope of living for Christ, the motivating factor. We don't have to be ashamed because we have the hope of the scriptures. It's based squarely upon fact. Help us not to be ashamed because he will be ashamed of us.
that is coming if we are. Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you will cause it to transform our lives, not merely to be something that we store in a pigeonhole, in a file cabinet, and on a shelf someplace in our brain, but something that changes the way that we live for Jesus. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight. Let me find the page that we marked. Much in life.